While there are a number of ways currently on the table to search for evidence of extraterrestrial civilizations, known as technosignatures, one stands out as the focus of a majority of SETI experiments both past and present. It's the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But why? What makes that method of communication so attractive over interstellar distances? Firstly, electromagnetic radiation is easy to produce. We do it all the time with our own signals and everything from our cell phones to satellite communications to radio stations. They also travel as fast as you can in the universe, in a vacuum traveling at the speed of light because it is light. Some have said that radio communication isn't likely to be used by alien civilizations as it's an old technology, one that we've had for over a century. It's been pointed out that alien civilizations might not use radio as a method of communication, rather they may do something far more advanced, such as the use of gravitational waves or neutrinos for communication, or even some method we have no knowledge of yet. It's very difficult to look for something for which you have no knowledge of, since you have no idea what you're looking for, so that's out, at least for now. As to gravitational waves and neutrinos, with gravitational waves they would have obvious advantages, as everyone with sensitive enough detectors would see such messages if announcing your existence is the goal. But you need a whole lot of mass and energy for this. You are manipulating gravity after all. A lot of it. Short of moving planets or neutron stars around, this method probably just isn't worth it when you simply want to communicate something. And then there's the problem of receiving such communications. It's far harder to pick up gravitational waves than it is picking up a radio signal. Likewise, neutrinos are also difficult to detect. Not impossible, but clarity of communication is important and radio wins out here as well. So as to the unknown or conceptual forms of communication we know about, it becomes a situation similar to that of fire. Humans have been using fire since the beginning. It's a very, very old idea. Yet we still use it today because, for its applications, it's still quite useful in comparison to its alternatives. Another advantage to radio is that one section of the radio spectrum is naturally very quiet, whether you're here or on an alien planet. It's an area where you don't get much interference from the galaxy that you do with lower frequencies. But you also don't get the noise from your own equipment that comes with higher frequencies. Yet another advantage is that the aliens would know about is that the dust in the galaxy is fairly transparent at these wavelengths, unlike in the optical area of the spectrum where it blocks light quite well. This will all be the case for advanced aliens everywhere in the galaxy, and why they might indefinitely use radio. Just because an idea is old doesn't automatically make it bad, so it still seems like aliens would understand and use the radio spectrum indefinitely. This is one of the reasons why the focus has been on radio and SETI. It simply works. If some anomaly is ever detected in the world of gravitational waves or neutrinos, then we'll see that as well. But it doesn't seem likely. The idea of searching for alien signals in the radio spectrum goes back to a paper published in 1959 by Giuseppe Cocconi and Philip Morrison, where they envisioned that alien civilizations might build beacons to announce their presence to the galaxy. They proposed that scientists search the nearest sun-like stars for signals, just in case someone might be out there. Most importantly, they proposed a very special frequency in which to look, 1420 megahertz or the 21 centimeter line. This frequency is that which hydrogen emits radio waves in nature. Alien scientists will know this frequency as well as they study radio emissions from hydrogen clouds in the galaxy. Hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. It's everywhere and any species with science is going to know what it is and how it behaves. This makes the 1420 MHz frequency an attractive place to locate a signal. Since if you just sent out a signal at any random frequency, anyone that you would wish to contact would need to just happen to tune into that frequency to hear you. That's not likely to happen, so a galactic benchmark is needed. 1420 MHz seems like an obvious choice, though modern SETI experiments look at far more frequencies than just that one. And there are other choices. Another example would be the frequency at which hydroxyl emits radio at around 1660 MHz. Hydroxyl and hydrogen together make water, the most likely solvent for life in the universe. And there are many other possible places to locate a signal like that. But the hydrogen line seems like the most likely place. Now, if we look at the hydrogen line, won't we see a bunch of interference from hydrogen? Yes and no. While hydrogen emits narrow band at the hydrogen line, it only stays there if it's absolutely stationary in a lab. Hydrogen clouds in the galaxy constantly move around, causing blue and red shift, as does the Earth and Sun. 
so the end result is a broadband interference around the hydrogen line. When you break that down into millions of narrow channels, then comparatively little interference gets in the way. One issue with radio, however, is the Earth's atmosphere. The various gases in the atmosphere absorb some wavelengths of radio. This could help or hurt our chances of detecting alien signals. If the aliens have a completely different atmosphere, or no atmosphere at all, as may be the case for a machine civilization, they may not think to transmit at frequencies that will pass through an oxygen, nitrogen, water vapor atmosphere like our own. And there is some terrestrial radio interference to contend with as well. Only eventual SETI experiments in space, such as a radio telescope on the far side of the moon where the moon will block Earth interference, and there is no atmosphere to contend with, will be able to get past these issues and open up other potential areas of the spectrum for searching. One interesting thing, however, is that by international agreement, the 1420 MHz hydrogen line is not intentionally broadcast on by humans, or at least it isn't supposed to be, leaving it free for radio astronomy. That's not to say it's completely clean. Spy satellites often do things that they aren't supposed to, and you can also get interference due to harmonics of other frequencies invading the line as well. But there is an interesting aspect here. The idea of narrowband signals as a sign of technology. In general, and only in very specific cases, does nature generate truly narrowband signals. But technology almost always does. There are several reasons for this. Number one, it saves energy. Broadcasting broadband takes more energy than broadcasting narrowband. It's assumed that the aliens would know this and be sensible and economical with their signals. The second is that narrowband signals don't bleed all over the radio spectrum. Useful if you want things like radio and television stations. Third, in respect to SETI, if you want everyone to know that you're there, narrowband is an indicator of a technologically produced signal in and of itself. It seems logical for any alien civilization to employ this type of signal if they want to be seen and verified. The problem, though, is that narrowband is narrowband, and the more narrowband you get, the more channels you need to pick it up, to the point of millions or more. The signals traveling through interstellar space and being affected by it do place a limit on what's practical here. The plus to looking at such narrow slices of the spectrum is that any signal found that narrow would make for an excellent candidate for an extraterrestrial signal. It's worth noting here, though not overstating, that such signals have been found. The most famous example is the WOW signal of 1977. The receiver that detected it had only 50 channels, but WOW was only seen in one of them. It was very narrowband. Secondly, it was very close to the hydrogen line, just slightly above it. And no, the WOW signal is not due to comets. That hypothesis was shot down by the scientific community fairly quickly after that paper came out. If comets emitted that strongly at 1420 MHz, radio astronomers would have seen that by now. It's often forgotten how powerful the WOW signal actually was. It was 30 times greater than the background, and was the strongest candidate signal the telescope that detected it ever found over decades of searching. The WOW signal stands as the best candidate signal ever detected thus far for a signal from an alien civilization. While the design of the telescope essentially eliminated the possibility of it having been interference from here, there's one thing about the WOW signal that renders it useless. It never repeated, and unless it ever does, it will forever be a huge question mark. And even if it does repeat, it takes us into rather mysterious territory. There was no modulation in the signal that could be detected, just a raw radio signal similar to radar. There was no message in the main signal itself. But there was an interesting pattern in the other numbers that are circled on the printout. What those are is unknown, nor is it known if they're related to the main signal or just random other signals. But unless it repeats, we won't ever know what those were either. The WOW signal does illustrate that even narrowband signals in SETI can be ambiguous, and you'd think aliens trying to announce themselves would try to do it unambiguously, but it's not the only candidate signal. A similar experiment called META in the 1990s found 37 events that were strong signals that looked good with no immediately obvious natural explanation, but not a single one has ever repeated. Modern receivers would have told us much more about these signals, but in the end, the receiver is only one part of the equation. To receive anything, someone must be transmitting, and that transmission must cross the vastness of interstellar space. The further from the transmitter, the weaker the signal gets. But you don't need that much power to transmit if you do it directionally. 
The power of a radio station, for example, put into a directional beam could be seen at over 100 light years away with a modest dish, but the signal would have to be aimed right at us. So how would an alien civilization seeking contact know to do that? This is where things get interesting. While human civilization has only been detectable for a short time, about a century, Earth's biosphere has been detectable from a distance for millions upon millions of years. These types of signatures are called biosignatures, and in the case of Earth include our atmosphere, which is profoundly affected by life. The alien civilization would see a world that has very odd levels of methane and oxygen. They might take a closer look in infrared and detect our vegetation, known as the vegetative red edge, where plants become highly reflective in that area of the spectrum. Essentially, anyone with a big enough telescope in the galaxy may know about this planet and know that it has life. They may send a signal just in case there is someone intelligent here. But a civilization within 100 light years would be able to detect our civilization directly, providing they were looking right at us. If they were watching long term, they would notice changes to the atmosphere that can't be natural, such as the addition of CFCs. They might also pick up our radar, or possibly even our television or radio signals. Though contrary to popular belief, they would not pick up the 1938 Berlin Olympics broadcast. That was far too weak. Some have suggested in the past that civilizations might be so interested in communications that they might broadcast their signals omnidirectionally. That would be a very daunting task. Firstly, it requires enormous amounts of energy to run a beacon transmitting in all directions. Sure, it would make it obvious to anyone in the galaxy looking. The broadcast does not need to be aimed directly at you, rather it's going out to everyone. The amount of energy and challenges inherent to broadcasting such a signal make it seem somewhat unlikely. So what happens when a signal is discovered? Verification. One of the first things to do is to determine if it's Earth's interference. This is relatively easy. If you move the telescope slightly away from the source of the signal, you should still see the signal if it was interference from Earth. With something distant, you won't. Then you track the motion of the signal itself. If it moves with the Earth's rotation, as the WOW signals seem to do, then that eliminates any real likelihood of satellites or other sources here on Earth or nearby it. And there are other indicators that the signal is far away that can be used. Once that's all accomplished and a signal seems to pass muster, the scientists would simply call other scientists and have them point their radio telescopes at the source and see if they pick it up as well. If they do, then such a signal becomes very interesting indeed. But what happens if and when they do detect a signal and confirm it? One comment I often see on this channel is that the government would never let that information out. There are many problems with that thinking. Firstly, which government? There are nearly 200 countries on Earth, all of which have governments. And SETI experiments are not limited to any one country. They are done in Russia, the US, China, and others. You'd need at least several, if not tens, of governments that don't really get along that well to all agree to keep the secret. And then you have to keep the scientists quiet, internationally. SETI in the US is privately funded. Contrary to popular belief, NASA stopped doing SETI decades ago when a particular congressperson went on a rampage through the government and did everything he possibly could to get funding for it cancelled. It hasn't been government funded in any meaningful way since. And you don't really even need scientists to do SETI searches. There are many private amateur radio astronomers also building dishes and taking a look. Point is, this would not be a very keepable secret, and in the end, an alien civilization light years away very likely does not pose an immediate threat to national security. If they're close enough to know to send a radio signal, then they already know about the Earth at least, and probably would have been here with an invasion fleet by now if they wanted this planet. And it's worth noting that such a hostile civilization wouldn't seem likely to give up the element of surprise and send out a signal saying they're on their way. And to be honest, there really isn't anything here for an alien civilization to expend all the energy to get here to take. The Earth is made of the same materials as the rest of the universe. Things like gold are everywhere. It would make more sense to mine a local asteroid for that sort of thing rather than spend years crossing space at great energy expense just to take Earth's gold. Same with the water. The universe is so loaded with ice that you don't need to leave home to find it. It's also worth remembering that Earth does not even have the largest liquid water ocean in the solar system. That distinction belongs to Ganymede. And even Europa has about twice the amount of liquid water that Earth has. So any water-seeking aliens would probably go there first rather than here. 
Earth does have a rather large gravity well that you need to defeat to take the water, less so with the Jovian moons. And in the last 4.5 billion years, no one seems to have taken any water from the solar system that we know of. That said, scientists within SETI have thought out a system of protocols for what should ideally happen after detection. They are common sense and very extensive. Essentially, once it's known that the signal is of likely alien origin and not a false alarm, but a verified, unambiguous signal where alien origin is the best explanation, then the public gets told, from the Secretary General of the UN to you and I. This would be one of the greatest, most profound discoveries in human history. It should and would be out there. What else is in the protocols is that no response should be given to such a signal until it's internationally agreed on just what to say if we even think it's prudent to respond. And that's where we get into what may be a huge problem with this whole thing. We may never be able to decipher the message, if there is one at all. It may be something creative, like a description of hydrogen similar to our own pioneer plaque, which depicted just that, since all civilizations with science to send interstellar signals or find wandering probes would know of hydrogen. Or it may be much more disappointing. Imagine waking up one day to an announcement of the unambiguous discovery of an alien civilization in the radio spectrum. Imagine the scientists proudly stating that we are not alone. And then would come the questions from the press. What are the aliens like? We don't know. Well, what did the message say? There wasn't one. It was just a very powerful raw signal. Well, what's that tell us? The reporters would ask. The answer might simply be, the aliens have radar and that may be all we ever know about that particular alien civilization. And that would be poetic in some way, since some of the strongest signals we have ever emitted came from the Arecibo radio telescope. There were two types. One was a radar signal to map some asteroids that never repeated, and the second was an intentional message to alien civilizations, and it never repeated. If anyone ever picks either of those up, we will be their wow signal. What does that tell us? Thanks for listening, I'm futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently addressing the commenters that were worried about the existential crisis crab rangoon concept from last week. I defeated the takeout food and consumed it. Decisively, it no longer exists. But the next day there may have been regrets, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular, in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.